It'll just be a few few moments before we we begin here. Do Dr. Ehlers is is in the building. I'm told so. <laughs> hearing will now come to order. Good morning and welcome to the Research and Science Education Subcommittee hearing on encouraging the participation of female students in the STEM fields. Over the past decades, girls and women have made substantial gains in breaking down barriers in both education and the workforce. However, women's participation rates in certain STEM disciplines remain disproportionately low. According to NSF, Although women earned more than half of all science and engineering bachelor's degrees in 2006, they earned only about 20% of degrees in engineering, computer science, and physics. Although this is an improvement from the time when I was earning my mechanical engineering degree at Northwestern 20 years ago, uh, more can be done to encourage women in these fields. We have heard time and time again that as a nation, we are not producing enough scientists and engineers for the increasing number of technical jobs of the future. We need to make sure that we have the scientific and technical workforce that we need if we are to remain a leader in a global economy. And it is not possible to do this without developing and encouraging all the talent in our nation. We must have women engineers, computer scientists, and physicists. By broadening the STEM pipeline to include more women and other underrepresented groups, we can strengthen our workforce. In the last Congress, Chairman Baird worked with Ms. Johnson to focus on issues for women in academic science and engineering. Today, we look at the beginning of the pipeline and examine what factors impact women in STEM fields from kindergarten 
to the end of college. The issue of uh, female students in STEM fields is something that is really close to home for me. My wife is a, an actuary who is a, a fellow with the Society of Actuaries. She's gone through all of her exams and reached the, the top of her field. And I, I asked her what encouraged her, uh, what really impacted her on, along the way. And for her, it was a advisor in college who uh, recommended uh, that she go and talk to a math professor who really encouraged her to be a math major and encourage her to uh, thereafter go into uh, actuarial sciences. So that was her story, and that's how she wound up where she is today. We know that women can face unique challenges throughout the STEM pipeline. And we invite today's witnesses to help us understand what these barriers are and how we can break them down. It's important for the federal government to do its part in supporting research and programs that encourage best practices to attract and retain women in STEM. But there's a role for disciplinary societies, formal and informal educators, nonprofits, businesses, and other stakeholders. Fortunately, there's a lot of good work already underway to address some of these challenges. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about what is working, what obstacles remain, and where we go from here. I thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Now I'm, the chair will recognize Dr. Ehlers for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the good words you've just spoken. Today's hearing is an opportunity for us to gain insight into the reasons why young women are being deterred from pursuing careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, better known as STEM. And I think it's essential because each one of us tends to think we know what the problem is and what the answers are. But I think we'll get the, we have, when we listen to the experts here today, we'll find out how wrong we are looking at it from our male perspective. But strengthening math and science education is essential to the future of American economic competitiveness, and the lack of female participation in these areas is a great hindrance that must be remedied. For one reason, just out of fairness to all involved. Secondly, because the nation can certainly benefit from the involvement of more individuals interested in math and science. Despite the fact that women represent more than half of all bachelor's degrees, they constitute only 25% of the STEM workforce in the United States. I have spent a considerable amount of time and effort in Congress promoting, promoting STEM education, and this committee has held multiple hearings on the topic, paying particular attention to the need for more women and minorities in STEM fields. As a professor, I've also spent a good deal of time trying to interest women in math and science, particularly with the idea of developing new opportunities for them, but also, since many of them were to become teachers, also changing their perspective on math and science and why it is important to teach math and science to everyone in the elementary school. Well, great strides have been made since my days as a student and later as a professor of physics at Calvin College and at Berkeley. The data still show great disparities in the participation of women in STEM. Much to my dismay, women represent only 21% of physics degrees, according to the National Science Foundation. It is my hope that today's observations will offer this committee insight into ways to better support these important fields of study as we continue to explore any federal role. I look forward to the testimony of our distinguished panel. I thank them for being here. But I just have to add one, one point that I think is essential, and that is the jobs of the future are going to require of the workers a basic understanding of the fundamental principles of mathematics and science. I don't think there's any disagreement with that. If we do not in some way persuade women to learn these topics in the elementary and secondary fields, we and they are automatically cutting themselves out of a great many job opportunities in the future. So let's hope we can do a better job than we have done. I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Ehlers, as usual, with your, uh, your background as a physicist and also uh, I know the great concern that uh, you have for, for, for science in this country and, and, and scientists. Uh, you always have a, have a lot of uh, important things to add, and uh, it's good, good to have you here as, uh, working with me on this. Uh, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. So now I would like to introduce our, our witnesses. First, we have Dr. Alan Leshner, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for Great Advancement of Science. Next, we have Dr. Marsha Rummett Kropp, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Girls Incorporated. Dr. Kropp comes to us from New York, and I know that Mr. Tonko had hoped that he'd be here to introduce her himself. But unfortunately, he is tied up with another committee this morning and will try to join us at, at some point. Next, we have Dr. Sandra Hansen, who is a professor of sociology at Catholic University. We have Ms. Barbara Bogue, who is an associate professor of engineering science and mechanics and women in engineering at Penn State. And finally, we have uh, Ms. Cheryl Thomas, who I know from back home in Chicago, who has worked in the, not only the administration of uh, Mayor Daley, but also in the Clinton administration. Uh, Ms. Thomas is currently the president and founder of Ardmore Associates, an engineering construction management firm in Chicago. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to, to ask questions. So. I ask you hopefully to stay in the five minutes here. Uh, your complete written statement will be added to the record. Uh, so with that, we will start with uh, Dr. Leshner. I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Ehlers, thank you for your leadership in convening this hearing, and thank you for the invitation for us to testify. As you know, the American Association for the Advancement of Science is the world's largest multidisciplinary scientific society, and we're the publishers of the well-known journal Science. Our involvement in education extends from pre-kindergarten through postgraduate and into the careers of the scientific workforce. We have a long history of efforts to increase the participation of girls and young women and to enhance the status of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The first woman president of AAAS was elected in 1970, and since that time, 35% of those in the presidential line have been distinguished women. 1973, AAAS created both an office of and a committee on opportunities in science, and their activities continue today. I'm very pleased to note that since the early days of advocacy and action related to women in STEM fields, the levels of enrollment and degrees awarded have overall increased dramatically. At K-12 to levels, participation gaps between males and females have disappeared in such courses as chemistry, advanced algebra, and pre-calculus mathematics. This then has affected women's course taking and professional aspirations at undergraduate and higher levels. As one example, in 1977, women received roughly 22% of doctoral degrees in the biological sciences, but as you know, by 2006, women received almost half of biological science PhDs in this country. Despite this kind of progress, however, some serious challenges remain, and I have to start with a general statement that for K-12 education overall, science and math standards are unfortunately way too low for all students, whatever their career goals, whatever their genders, and we as a country have got to do something to change that. From my perspective, that's the largest problem facing education in this country. In high schools and colleges, gaps still do persist for young women in pursuing courses like physics, calculus, and computer science, as you noted. But here, the percentage has actually decreased over time, and that needs focused attention. Women overall have about a 40 percent share, a share within the overall physical sciences, but that number masks the fact 
that in 2006, although women received half the bachelor's degrees in fields like astronomy and chemistry, as you noted, women received only 20% of the bachelor's degrees in physics, and women still receive only 20% of bachelor's degrees in engineering. The gap is real, the gap exists. It's more problematic that even when women do pursue science degrees, many leave the scientific workforce because of the lack of career opportunities that enable them to do a better job balancing having a career and a life outside the laboratory. Fortunately, there have been some, but frankly too few, federal programs as well as changes in culture in some institutions to change this. Just as one example, the advanced program of the National Science Foundation is an example of an effective mechanism to foster these accommodations. So what can we do? Well, organizations like AAAS have a robust set of career-related activities generally working cooperatively through something we established called a Center on Careers in Science and Technology. And both alone and through external partnerships, we produce materials that feature young and established women in STEM careers, telling their stories, providing guidance to guidance counselors and educators. We also have a Center on Advancing Science and Engineering Capacity. Its purpose is to emphasize research-based interventions of demonstrated effectiveness in order to help universities fully develop and utilize the talents of women and minority students and faculty. And I might point out that we try to provide role models as well. Women are active and visible participants in every aspect of the leadership of AAAS speakers and organizers of our meetings and conferences, leaders in the organization's governance, and I should point out that among the senior staff, over 50% are female. How about the federal government? Many of us believe that a new call to serve for young men and women needs to link the critical role of education in STEM fields with the opportunity to address global concerns. Young people are far more interested in the relevance of what they do with their lives than they were at least in my generation when I was trained as a scientist where if you worried about relevance, you had sold out. We also need much better data and statistics. It's critical to improve the re recruitment and retention in STEM fields to help identify measures of success and to figure out what's working and what the climate is. We also need to support research to help us identify and better understand best practices that do work, that are effective in providing greater support. Let me conclude by saying that it's critical that the United States have access to the full talent of all its citizens and that every effort has to be made to enable that. As we, press, as we face pressing societal challenges, all of whose solutions involve science and technology, either directly or indirectly, we can't afford to allow the great potential contributions of women to go untapped. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leshner. Now, uh, recognize Dr. Kropp. Mr. Chairman, um, Ranking Member Ehlers, um, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. As you know, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Girls Incorporated. That's the national nonprofit that inspires all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. On behalf of Girls Inc., our 96 local affiliates, and the girls we serve, I'm pleased to present our approach to advancing girls' interest, confidence, and competence in STEM fields. In 1985, with funding from the National Science Foundation, we launched Girls Inc. Operation Smart, our program to help girls develop enthusiasm for and skills in STEM. Since that time, more than 750,000 girls have participated in this program. Our experience with Operation SMART and our research and development leads us to three important messages for you today. First, despite gains in the number and achievement of girls and women in STEM, substantial gaps remain. Over the past 30 years, as the barriers of entry into many STEM fields have eased, women have vastly increased their proportion of academic degrees earned in STEM, as you just heard. At the same time, however, gaps remain. Girls in the United States today grow up at a time when women have unprecedented opportunities, but they're also aware that in our society, stereotypes persist. 
In a 2006 Girls Inc. survey conducted by Harris Interactive, 55% of girls in grades 3 through 12 agreed with this statement, in my school, boys think they have the right to talk about girls' bodies in public. 44% of girls, half, almost half, agreed that the smartest girls in my school are not popular. 36% said people think girls are not interested in computers and technology. And 17% of girls thought it was true that teachers think it's not important for girls to be good at math. And those statistics, by the way, didn't change months since the, an earlier survey in 2000. Um, this last finding leads to our second message, that informal science education is a critical strategy to address the gender gap. The National Academies recently published a report on learning science in informal settings, advising that schools should not be solely responsible for addressing the scientific knowledge needs of society. And we at Girls Inc. agree. Informal education allows students the ability to learn, to discover through prolonged, hands-on collaborative experiences, to become comfortable making mistakes, and using trial and error method to solve complex problems. To cite just one example, at our Girls Inc. affiliate in Schenectady, New York, girls created working toy hovercrafts. They were so excited by their success that they decided to try to bring their experiment to scale. Using plywood and a leaf blower, they constructed a hovercraft that was strong enough to lift girls four inches off the floor. And we know that our approach has an impact. Girls in Eureka, our four-week STEM sports camp, um, increased their plans to take math courses. Their interest in science careers increased as well. And the percentage of girls who were predominantly urban minority girls whose wish for the following school year was to do well and be on the honor roll increased from 38% to 66%. At Girls Inc., we pay explicit attention to equity. We assume girls are interested in math, science, and technology. We encourage them to see themselves as scientists. When our first robotics Lego League teams go to competition, staff have observed it's the boys who are operating the robots on the co-ed teams. On our teams, and those sponsored by our friends, the Girl Scouts, girls do it all. We expect girls to succeed, and we help them to develop the same expectations of themselves. We also include adult women role models, as they are essential in helping girls to be aware of career options and to envision themselves in those careers someday. In 2004, we surveyed women who had previously received Girls Inc. College scholarships. Of the 85 respondents, 51% said, my Girls Inc. experience inspired me to pursue my interest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. My final point is that the federal government has a vital role to play in increasing girls' participation in STEM fields. First, continue to support the NSF's informal science education program and the research on gender in science and engineering. Secondly, promote informal STEM education through federally funded after-school programs. Third, support professional development for teachers and youth workers in informal STEM education and in gender equitable teaching methods. And finally, promote the increased enforcement of Title IX. Thank you for doing your part through this important work of the committee. As we say at Girls Inc., it doesn't matter where a girl is from as long as she knows where she's going. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kropp. Uh, Chair, now recognize Dr. Hansen. Chairman Lipinski, Ranking Member Ehlers, distinguished members, I'm Sandra Hansen. I'm Professor of Sociology at Catholic University. I've been doing research on girls in science for several decades now, and it's a pleasure to be here. One of the myths about girls in science is that from the time they start school, girls are less interested in science than boys. In my research and that of others, we show girls start out with equal interests and abilities in science. Things start changing, though, as early as the second grade. One NSF study found that when second grade girls and boys 
draw pictures of scientists. They draw a white male in a lab coat. Usually, the scientist is alone with a beaker or a test tube. And when they draw a woman scientist, she's fairly severe and unhappy looking. I've found that the departure from STEM even happens for very talented girls who show promise in science. What about the nature versus nurture argument? The notion that boys are naturally better at math and science continues to be a popular one. A recent study looked at 3,000 pairs of British twins and uh, 9, 10, and 12 years of age. They looked at genetic and environmental factors that affected math and science achievement. They found no difference in math and science achievement at 9, 10, and 12, and more importantly, no difference in um, the influence of genetic and environmental factors on the boys and girls at these ages. So they concluded it's more about attitudes than aptitude. So what's going on? Why are women leaving STEM? One of the issues is textbooks. If students don't see images in textbooks of people that look like themselves, they can't connect. Science textbooks are improving, but they show many more images of male scientists. One um, NSF-funded study at Colorado State looked at elementary school science textbooks and found 66% of the images were of men and 34% were of women. But there's been progress in STEM education. Recently, for the first time ever, two women, young girls, won the grand prizes in the prestigious Siemens National Math and Science competition. And my research shows there's more progress in STEM education than occupations. So that in 2006, women earned 20% of the PhDs in engineering, but there were only 12% of the employed engineers. In some areas, girls get more degrees than boys. Chemistry and biological sciences are two of them. Employers can no longer argue that there's a shortage of qualified female science talent. One of the things that's implicit in my research is that you can't just talk about girls in science. Science is not just a uh, male culture, it's a white male culture. So that an impor important uh, lesson from my work is that uh, men and women's experiences in science vary across social class and race groups. When I looked at African American women in science recently, I found tremendous interest and engagement, and many people have missed this, uh, including social scientists who think that the race and uh, gender disadvantage is a double disadvantage for them, thus they must not be interested in. Although I have found a loss of science talent amongst young women, I'm quite optimistic. I see more uh, interest. I see uh, the interest amongst minority uh, women. I also have looked at the role of sport as a resource uh, for young women. Sport encourages independence, teamwork, competition, the same traits that tend to be associated with women's success in the male domain of science. So female athletes have an advantage in science over non-athletes. And so young girls who are given an early opportunity in sport might be less intimidated and more prepared for the culture of the science classroom. I'm also encouraged by evidence from single-sex STEM education. Many women scientists today have spent at least some of their time at single-sex universities. In 2006, uh, several researchers at University of Michigan studied the progress of girls in two schools, almost identical uh, math curriculum, but one was co-ed and one was single sex. And at the end of the year, they measured their progress in math and found those in the single sex school outscored those in the co-ed school by over 50%. There's things that work. Uh, there's things that we can do. Um, 
My time is running short, but I know that the new practice guide published by the National Center for Education Research entitled Encouraging Girls in Math and Science offers very specific things for schools and teachers in terms of increasing girls' participation and interest in science. Guides such as this one should be integrated into our curriculum. Girls deserve equal access to STEM, and we can do better, and I think both boys and girls would benefit from improving our STEM education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Uh, Chair, and I recognize Ms. Bogue. Um, I'm speaking today for the Society of Women Engineers, founded in um, 1950. SWE is a 20,000 member educational and service organization that empowers women to succeed and advance in the field of engineering. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the subcommittee for providing this opportunity and uh, really appreciated your comments. So I should start out by saying, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. Um, I will focus my comments on the need for improved assessment and evaluation practices and on specific challenges that we face in our effort to increase the numbers of girls and women entering and succeeding in STEM-related fields. I will emphasize engineering, that's my primary experience and knowledge, but the basic assumptions and recommendations really can apply across STEM fields in which women are underrepresented. We know that women are graduating from high school and prepared to enter engineering. High school girls take 47% of all AP calculus tests and 31% of AP physics tests. So the real question is not whether in women can do engineering, it's why aren't they doing engineering and how can we get them there? One key is a better understanding of what works and what not, what does not. As director of women in engineering, I developed the women in engineering program at Penn State and I developed an orientation there, a bridge program, that yielded the highest retention rate of any program in the College of Engineering. For that, I was recognized with the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. Um, devel developing an assessment plan to measure the success of the program with Rose Mara, who's co-founder and co-director of the AWE Project, which I'll talk about in a bit, helped me understand what was working and led to the realization that the need for help in creating good assessment and evaluation is a universal need among programs with lean budgets and staffs. So we created the Assessing Women and Men in Engineering Project, which is funded by NSF's Gender and Science um, and Engineering Program, Research in Gender and Science and Engineering Program, to develop survey tools that measure program effectiveness and allow comparisons of outcomes among programs. We have more than 50 of these tools now, the surveys along with a lot of capacity building tools. All moved into the Society of Women Engineers to sustain the projects, many projects and services. A list of current AWE products is submitted for the hearing record. Assessment is essential for success and funders have a role to play. The federal government should require meaningful assessment of funded activities aimed toward the goal of broadening participation. Federal Title IX reviews, like those conducted by NASA, are an effective tool for identifying activities that would benefit from added scrutiny. There are many ways to break down barriers to the recruitment and development of women in STEM in addition to having better assessment of the programs. I will focus on three. First, applying to research to practice is essential for success. Basic research through programs like NSF, GSE, is a critical tool for increasing the numbers of women in engineering and other STEM fields. Second, climate studies are important in uncovering barriers for women in engineering. Unwelcoming classrooms, outdated teaching styles, a lack of com accommodation for different social or cultural experiences, a lack of good advising, can all create an environment that students decide to leave rather than thrive in. This affects all students, men and women. Our results, the our project results and other findings belie the postulation that women do not pursue engineering because they are not interested or don't have the talent. Rather, they indicate that women who have the talent and the interest are being turned off by how the discipline is being presented. Finally, sustained and targeted funding is necessary. Funding for basic research, funding to design and implement programs, and funding to support individuals. In conclusion, we'd like to recommend the following. 
sustain and target funding for programs and activities that focus on attracting and retaining women in STEM careers, on removing institutional barriers to their success, on basic re research related to those goals. Review federal funding requirements and set guidelines to ensure that funded programs address national priorities that we've all talked about here today and attract a diverse population. Support the continuation of federal Title IX reviews to increase understanding of the issues that inhibit full participation of women in STEM at the college level. And finally, support women who wish to pursue engineering degrees. Reward institutions that are successful in increasing the number of women studying STEM disciplines. Forty years ago, the first human set foot on the moon. We achieved this because we had the national will to achieve that goal, but we also supported it financially. One example is the National Defense Education Act, which ensured an innovative and productive engineering workforce that could do the work to get there. President Obama has set out an equally ambitious goal to increase R&D funding to levels exceeding those of the space race. To achieve full participation of women and other, other underrepresented groups in this bold new endeavor requires a bold commitment. We at the Society of Women Engineers look forward to and support your efforts in this regard. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Bogue. And finally, I have the Chair recognize Ms. Thomas. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Ehlers, uh, distinguished members of Congress and the subcommittee. I am both humbled and pleased that I've been asked to testify before you today. Uh, rather than a direct academic pursuit of engineering, I came to the field by quite a, a circuitous route. Um, actually, I, I really did not know anyone personally who was an engineer. However, through the encouragement and development of my scientific and mathematical aptitude and the forward thinking of leaders in my life, my mother, teachers, and mentors, I came uh, to the STEM field. I hope that you can bear with me for a few moments while I give you a, a brief synopsis of my career path. My earliest recollection of building materials was a Christmas morning when I spied a very large box of Tinker Toys. These were for my oldest brother. He admonished me not to put my sticky paws on his Tinker Toys. They were special for him to build things. Of course, I couldn't wait to set the Big Ben alarm clock to get up in the middle of the night and play with that set. As fortune would intervene, eventually my brothers got an erector set. The Tinker Toys cast aside became mine. The first thing I built was a windmill. All these years later, when I see the wind turbines dotting the landscape in rural areas, I have wondered how many of the engineers who have designed or built wind turbines had their interests sparked in their youth by a simple set of Tinker Toys. Throughout my academic career, I was always interested in the sciences and I was encouraged to think about or pursue the biological sciences. In high school, I demonstrated an aptitude for chemistry. My career path was set. I would concentrate on biology and chemistry and think about medicine or scientific research. I received awards for participating in science fairs all four years of high school. One Saturday a month, I went to the Science Academy in Lincoln Park, and every other Sunday to the Museum of Science and Industry, close to where I lived in High Park. Armed with this foundation, I went off to university, prepared to major in bio biology and chemistry. I completed my undergraduate studies and went to work for the Department of Water and Sewers in the city of Chicago as a research chemist. I was quite content in this role. I completed a master's degree while working for the city and began coursework for a doctorate. The latter was interrupted when I was chosen as the first woman to participate in a program of sending young people, up until this point in time, young male engineers, to work in various units of the Department of Water and Sewers to cultivate uh, an understanding of how the, uh, not only the units worked, but how the department worked in total. It is very important to note that this decision was made by the commissioner of the department. I was assigned to the chief engineer in the commissioner's office. The time period was the early 70s. This was not a simple or easy decision to make. To complicate matters, I was not a degreed engineer. Instead, I was learning on the job. To his credit, and I thank him always, the chief engineer convinced me to go back to school and take engineering courses. That was the end of the biological sciences and the beginning of a new endeavor. I was the first woman to work in the field on a shutoff crew for the Department of Water. 
Eventually, I ended up running that crew. What were the barriers I faced? This was unusual. Women were not supposed to work shifts. There were no facilities for women, and quite frankly, women would interfere with the way men talked and worked. Of course, over a short period of time, their fears and mine were assuaged. We were all there to do a job. In hindsight, what a great opportunity and what a great experience. I worked many years for the Water Department before going on to work in various other infrastructure departments, which culminated in my overseeing all of the infrastructure departments when I went to work in Mayor Daly's office as his Deputy Chief of Staff. In 1994, the Mayor appointed me as Commissioner of the Department of Buildings. I was the first woman to hold this position. In this role, my field experience and practical side of engineering would have to get me through learning and understanding the design side. I do credit the discipline of being involved in the sciences as preparation for this demanding role and as preparation for successful completion of any daunting task. The biggest challenges to attracting and retaining women and girls in the STEM fields, I, I think, are exposure at an early age, encouragement and nurturing of ideas, the pervasive tendency to promote the sciences as career fields for boys and men, although medicine is the exception to this rule. The most promising solutions continuing to work as a committee such as this to study and lend credence to the problem. Funding to add programs of mathematics, chemistry, and physics to primary as well as secondary education. Exposing girls and young women to other women who are pursuing these fields. Um, in a humble way, I do think drawing attention to women like myself who have come through the ranks, who have persevered and who are now presidents and CEOs of their own engineering firms, helps to promote the value of being smart girls and women with STEM field aptitudes. In closing, I would like to thank you again for inviting me to testify before you today. I am committed through various organizations and academic institutions to promoting not only women and minorities in sciences, but also to developing interests and skills and expanding STEM opportunities to people as a whole. I heard a very disturbing statistic that only about 4% of our young people in this country seek to have careers in the sciences. Those seeking these careers in other countries are as high as 40%. If we do not address this issue, who will build our roads and bridges? It is a question we must answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, and thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. And now we will move on to the uh, Q&A, and the uh, chair will begin by recognizing uh, Ms. Fudge for, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here today. Um, we know that uh, research has shown us that uh, certainly female STEM role models are the best way to encourage young people, young women, uh, to become involved in this area. And, and no offense, Mr. Leshner, but I just would love for some of the young people in our urban schools in particular to see you here today and to be encouraged by what you have done in your careers. And I thank you for being here. And I thank you for your testimony as well. Uh, the question I have, because I, I am keenly aware that in our urban schools in particular, which I represent primarily, uh, there are very few role models in our schools, whether they be counselors or science teachers or uh, engineers, and that's the unfortunate part of this. So my question becomes, how do we incorporate in an informal education way uh, dealing with the underrepresented uh, groups of, in the STEM fields, and how do we get to young women, uh, especially African American women, uh, in our communities, and, and what best practices can we use that can be transferred from an informal setting to the classroom setting? Anyone or everyone? Well, okay. <laughs> well, um, I agree with you completely about your issue about role models and role models for girls of color. Three quarters of the girls served by Girls Incorporated are girls of color. Um, our Operation SMART program includes the whole concept of bringing in adult women scientists, engineers, and mathematicians, architects, uh, archaeologists, to work on projects with the girls. Um, it's not just a career day where a woman comes in and talks about her career, but the girls actually see adult women making mistakes, 
because making mistakes in science is important. That's how you learn. And they see adult women scientists getting their hands dirty, and they can talk casually with them about what it's like to have a scientific career. I just recently finished a study on young African-American women in science. It's uh, swimming against the tide. And when I talked to them, surveyed them, they don't see their schools as having good resources. Uh, they don't see people as thinking much of them becoming scientists. One of the young girls said they look at us like we're not supposed to be scientists. And so um, what they want is people who think that they can do it. They want more resources in their schools. They, not, they can see that their schools have fewer resources, especially science. Their labs are not good labs. They want field trips. They want hands-on uh, labs. And I think we need to figure out a way to uh, redistribute our resources so that if you're uh, unlucky enough to be going to school in a poor school district, you shouldn't be punished with uh, poor science labs. Dr. Hansen, if I could just say one thing about your comments, well, two. Uh, I think you're right about athletes, not because I was an athlete, but because uh, I don't know anything about science. Uh, I'm learning as I sit on this committee <laughs> every day. But I love the concept of what you said uh, because it does encourage you and it makes you believe that there are things you can do. Um, as well, I want to say that as I leave here, and I am going to be doing that shortly because we have a, a mock-up in our Education and Labor Committee, we're going to be talking about exactly what you said. We're going to be finding ways to bring more resources into our schools, especially our urban cores, uh, for labs, for uh, computer technology, for things that we think are going to make uh, young people more um, able to, to actually understand, to get excited about what's out there, because uh, they can do hands-on. So I thank you as well. Thank you. I'd like to um, add a couple of things to that. One is the intentionality of role modeling. I, th I think the idea of bringing them in informally, um, not specifically as, as role models, this is an excellent idea. But it's very, very important to assess the process and look at whether those role models have, fact, in fact, done the work that you want them to do. It's very possible to have people who look like they're going to be perfect role models to come in and end up discouraging the children from going on. So that's an important thing. And I think another thing is that um, when, when we do bring these people in, it, it, it can be informal, but it also has to be very intentional. They have to understand why they're there and what they should be doing to make sure that these girls and boys make the connection between them being there and working with them and what they can do in their lives. You're absolutely right, athletics does help. I was an athlete, and, <laughs> and it does help. And you also have to be able to step outside your comfort zone. Um, to be the first woman to go out on the street with a crew, I can't even impress upon you how, uh, how difficult that was. But the fact is, you have to stay with it. You can't be easily discouraged. And I was armed with the knowledge that I probably knew as much as, as they did. And once we both became comfortable, it was fine. Um, I think that we really do have to nurture uh, young girls to, to realize if they have ideas that it's okay. You don't have to be channeled somewhere else. And that, that's kind of what happened to me. I was channeled to think of research rather than the hard uh, sciences of which I went back and took just fine because I could uh, persevere in those fields. So I think nurturing and, and sticking with it is, is very important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Hey, uh, Ms. Fudge, I have to say, uh, I'm a, uh, an engineer, and I've been on this committee for three terms, and certainly I learn more and more every day, too. So you're, you're, you're not the only one. We're all, we're all go, go through that. So uh, Chair, I now recognize uh, Dr. Ehlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so many questions and so little time. <laughs> but I really appreciate your testimony and, and your comments. I was struck by several things. Uh, Ms. Ms. Tom, as you mentioned, you didn't know any engineers when you were young and growing up. Uh, I think that's, that's a good deal of the problem. A lot of uh, both boys and girls don't get exposure these days. In the old days, growing up on the farm, the boys got a lot of exposure to mechanical things, chem you know, chemistry, etc. The girls didn't. Today, neither one often does. And I, when I give speeches to societies of engineers and scientists, I say, 
go to your near school, go to your kid's school, talk to the teachers, ask if you can go in and talk to the class and just tell them what you do in your work. And uh, perhaps arrange a field trip to your lab or your office, or if you're a civil engineer, take them out on the job. Have them learn how bridges are designed and made. Um, and I, th I think that's a very important activity. The discouraging part is some of these people who have done that have been turned down by the teachers and say, we don't have time for that, which is very unfortunate. Uh, I was amused by your comment, Ms. Thomas, that uh, when you joined the crew, it's, it seemed to affect the way men talked. And <laughs> having served on construction crew myself in my college years, I, I can say uh, you probably only improved their language. <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Uh, another comment was, was made, I think Dr. Croft uh, said some, something about girls feel ostracized by others when they t study the sciences and math, and particularly when they do well. Um, that's not uncommon, and in fact, I experience the same thing, even though obviously I'm a male. Um, but the um, I still remember, even at the college level, getting a paper back in class, a test paper, and immediately slapping it on the desk face down so that my colleagues couldn't see what grade I got. And just, uh, it's, it's incredible that someone who did well has to be ashamed of what they did. Uh, but yet that's part of what goes on in society at times. It's, uh, it's the way for the less competent to get even with you, I suppose. Um, but what I do when I speak in high schools, I make a big deal out of this. And I tell, first of all, I'm a nerd, and I'm proud of it, which shocks them a little bit. First of all, they don't believe it until I show them my pocket protector. <laughs> uh, but then I, I talk a bit about that. I say, who's the richest man in the world? They all know that. I said, he's a nerd. I said, I can predict that when you get out of school, and that's why choosing the right course is so important in high school, when you get out of school and you start looking for a job, your choices are pretty simple. You will either be a nerd or you're going to work for a nerd. <laughs> now, now, which of those do you want? <laughs> and it really sort of wakes them up. You know, they, they just don't have that much contact with the real world, and it does, does make them think. Uh, some of this, I think, applies very well to, to girls and women as well, just to, to say, hey, lots of opportunities out there. You may not have heard about them. They may not even appeal to you at this point. But think about it. Just think about it and what, what you can do. I'm just delighted with what you've done, and you are living examples to, to a lot of the women and the girls in the schools today. And that has to be multiplied over and over again. Uh, the, the innate prejudices that we have in society are still there, and there are many types of them, and uh, we, have to, we have to break through the mold on that. So I just want to thank you for what you've done. I, I learned a great deal from your comments here, and I hope we can all, working together, continue to, to illuminate this problem, because illumination is half the battle. And some of the things we've done in, in this committee uh, about publicizing opportunities for women in science and the Commission on Women in Science and some of these things are really beginning to have an impact. Uh, but you are the leaders in having this impact, and I thank you for it. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ehlers. And uh, we have a uh, member, not of the subcommittee here, but who has a great interest in this. Uh, area, so I uh, welcome uh, Ms. Woolsey to the uh, to the subcommittee here, and I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for letting me sit in. I too have uh, the higher ed markup, which is very important to women and girls. Well, women particularly by higher ed and uh, STEM. Uh, and thank you for being here today. And Dr. Leshner, thank you for getting it for women and, and under representative groups and all of you wonderful women for setting such a good example. Uh, this is an issue that is very important to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't come to a subcommittee I'm not a member of, believe me. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, because we have to get more inv girls involved in STEM education uh, to keep them there, uh, not just getting them involved, but keeping them interested uh, throughout school uh, so that they can turn it into a career. At the very least, what I say is uh, young women, underrepresented minorities, don't have to be scientists, engineers, mathematicians, but they have to have the option by the time they get to college. And if they cut themselves off and, and act un disinterested, don't get involved in the right curriculum, to have it available to them, by the time they get to college, it's too late. So uh, that's why uh, I sponsored the inclusion of the appropriately named Patsy T. Mink Fellowships in the Higher Education Reauthorization Act that uh, passed by Congress and was signed into law by President Bush last year because the Patsy T. Mink Fellowships provide uh, funding and fellowships to encourage women and minorities to go into the graduate programs where they are represent, underrepresented, like the STEM programs, and then move them uh, into teaching fields because part of it is having a female or, or a, a minority model as your teacher. That is so important. And beyond that, uh, I have introduced uh, many congresses in a row and am preparing to reintroduce a bill I call Go Girl which will provide grants to schools to promote STEM education for girls and underrepresented minorities from K through 12. Because um, I've been working on this issue uh, both for elementary education and for graduate study for many, many years because if we don't get more girls and underrepresented minorities into uh, uh, the STEM fields, uh, we're gonna be sending our jobs overseas. I mean, first of all, we want these groups to have the advantage that uh, STEM provides them, and we want the advantage as a nation of their great brilliance of, like all of you have represented up here. But we don't want to be sending these jobs overseas with the new green industries and green technologies. We're going to sit here and not have enough brain power to make this happen when we know we have it. So. Um, my question to you, and I know I've talked a long time to be getting answers now, but is uh, at what point do young women in particular turn away from knowing that they're good in science and math, math particularly in science in the under, un, you know, K through 12, and when, sh how important is it for their parents and their teachers uh, to step in and encourage them? Middle school is a, is a big area that girls come into and um, the popularity begins to play in, the attitudes of teachers, the access to facilities. So um, what we always encourage girls to do is just kind of be able to go underground <laughs> and, yeah. and be able to make sure that they follow their interests and are comfortable with being a little bit odd. And I think that's where the sports can really come in too, that, that they can be proud of this. I think you also get another big break um, when the girls are in high school and are deciding, as you point out, on what kind of curriculum they're going to take. A lot of, and underrepresented minorities, a lot of the students at that point opt out of higher level math. Um, that's very hard to make up at the university level. Going into the university, you get a lot of students starting out in, in STEM fields and they'll start to make the decision not to. Um, I was speaking with a colleague today who was saying that she opted out of engineering because she wanted to study Russia and the curriculum didn't accommodate that. Mm -hmm. That's changing, but it needs to change more because of course the engineers we need today need to have a broader liberal arts type education. Right. Dr. Hansen? Um, I agree, middle school. Uh, girls start moving towards uh, getting status from romantic relationships during that time, even very talented ones. The status comes more from that than from academics. But I might also say that um, as early as second grade, these draw scientist tests show the, them, um, even if they're talented in science and math, they're drawing pictures of male scientists. And um, just to one of your other points about the, the, labor, the science labor force, I think there's a lot of proof now that um, we need a diverse science labor force for better ideas and better inventions 
and uh, better science. And there, I'm so glad that there's people that have shown that we do better science with more diversity in science because we need this to be competitive. Thank you very much, much Mr. Chairman, for having me here. Can I just speak to the question go, about well, that? Go ahead, Dr. The Chairman. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the National Council for Women in IT recently published a report that they conducted with the Girl Scouts, which showed that women are more likely than men to say they entered careers in STEM because of encouragement from a teacher, a family member, or a friend. And we also at Girls Inc. find parents extremely important in our most recent publication, Thinking Smart. We have a whole section called Smart at Home, which we've actually translated into Spanish for our Latino families, um, that has resources and suggestions about things you can do at home to encourage your children. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I just say, I mentioned Patsy Mink, uh, our colleague that did so much for us and was the mother of Title IX. Uh, sports is so important because young women learn to work as a team. They learn to be the captain. They, they learn also to uh, do their very individual best. Uh, so we need, we, we've gotten started with athletics. We must not let that stop. And now we need to have uh, education at exactly that level or greater. So thank you again. Thank you, and I will, Chair O'Neill will recognize himself for five minutes. Uh, as I was listening to all this, I certainly had uh, you know, similar experiences as, you know, going through my time in college as an engineer, and I, I certainly think that things, um, a lot of things that, that could have been better for, for everybody. Um, it, there are, are broader issues uh, for everyone in you know, who, who's in the, in the STEM field. Certainly, I don't think that uh, there was enough in, in my education in terms of really relating what we were doing in the classroom to you know, the real world. Uh, there was not enough connection between the classroom and the real world and with professionals who were out there. Um, so I certainly understand those, and I. I think then that there is a, uh, as you said, probably a special place for women to be involved, and I, uh, you know, thank those who are involved. And in, for example, Ms. Thomas for, for being involved in uh, really in encouraging and help mentoring, uh, especially uh, women in, in these these areas. Uh, a lot of what we, some of the things we talked about, especially Dr. Crop and uh, Ms. Bogue. I had talked about informal science education and the importance of the family, uh, which is a good advertisement here for a hearing we're having in the subcommittee next week on uh, systems approach to STEM ed, which includes uh, some of those uh, areas uh, because I think informal science education is, is very important and also all the factors that uh, have an impact on who is, uh, who is going to go into the STEM fields, who's going to not just go into STEM fields, but getting the STEM education, which is not just for those who are going to make that, uh, make that their career. Uh, so you know, for everyone, stay tuned next week for, that, uh, for, for our next hearing on that. But I think this plays very well into that. Uh, one question I want to, uh, to ask is, why are there some fields like physics in computer science that uh, representation of women is, is so low, whereas other fields like 62% of biology degrees go to women. I mean, I did not want, that was one area, that was the one area I did not want to be involved in whatsoever. Uh, when I was in school, I remember having to dissect the fetal pig in high school, and that <laughs> completely turned me off of biology. Uh, I'm surprised in, in I, I'm amazed that 45 percent of uh, math degrees go to women because uh, that certainly uh, was not what I had had seen in uh, you know, when I was in school. So, but why are these other fields? Why is there? It seems in some of these fields that uh, we sort of put into into STEM, there's much greater female participation, while others that there is less. What what's causing that? What do we know about it? Who wants to start out? 
Maybe I can add a little bit. I, I think a large problem generally is the absence of highly visible role models. That is, in some fields that have a history of uh, being less than fully friendly to women, uh, the absence of very well-known and very well-respected role models is a problem. And I think that we need to do a better job of highlighting those successful role models. For example, in astronomy, we have people like Vera Rubin, who's among the most respected scientists in this country. And she has inspired a large number of young women. We just don't seem to give recognition to women in some fields as much as we do in others. The number of role models in the life sciences who are women far exceeds the percentage in most of these other fields, so that one feels as if it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we do know that role models play a very important role, as do teachers. The fact that a, a young woman has a female teacher has a far greater influence on her willingness to enter STEM fields than the gender of a, a young man's uh, teacher. That, did that make sense? Was that in English? Um, I meant it to be. Uh, I understood what you meant. Good, thank you. And, and that's true for underrepresented minorities as well. Ms. Bogue? Well, I guess my first response is we wish we knew, uh, because then we could do more about it. Um, and there's a lot of research in this area, and certainly the role model is very important. The critical mass is very important. I mean, we're tossing around the 18% number for women who have graduated in engineering. If you look at electrical engineering or, or mechanical engineering, we're down to the 11 and 12 percent, which means that uh, girls can go, th women can go through um, undergraduate programs and literally never see another woman in her class or never, importantly, have a woman professor ahead of the class. And so this is an important thing that they, they don't find out about it, um, but then I think the more important thing is climate. We go back to the climate issue. These are male professions. They have been developed um, by males, and so there's pretty much generally a male environment in those. And unless there's some intervention that makes it comfortable for people who aren't male, who aren't white male, to come into those, those environments, it's hard for women to penetrate it. Uh, and we hear this all the time. It's not anecdotal. We see it in research and the, the way that women respond in their decisions and why they go into particular disciplines. And finally, I think it's um, very important to uh, look at how they are recruited into these, what they see when they look at it. Um, the recent National Academies report on changing the conversation touched on this. There's a lot of things that are controversial about that report. But it is really important to remember that when we talk about mechanical engineering, we shouldn't just talk about motors. We should talk about all of the other things that mechanical engineering do, airing does. And then we note that medical is the one exception to where girls are encouraged to go on um, to become doctors now and, and nurses and nurse practitioners, but, but they're encouraged to go ahead. And I, you see in some of the larger uh, the engineering disciplines that have larger proportions of women, chemical engineering, bioengineering, environmental engineering, have that kind of component. So I think we see some beneficial bleed off from girls understanding that they can be interested in these areas. Dr. Anson. Cheryl touched on the issue of toys. I don't think we can stress toys and games enough. Uh, computer science is something that boys have such an advantage in because they do play computer toys, computer games so much more than young girls do. They just feel that they're naturally suited to it. So I, I think the issues of toys and games and parents is also very important. Thanks. Ms. Thomas. I think that it's, um, it's quite interesting, and I certainly don't know the psychology of it, but it seems to be that um, if you are interested in the sciences or in math or physics, that for some reason for young women, it is a natural to tract, to go into medicine. And certainly we need uh, good doctors and 
uh, biomechanical engineering is becoming a field that is huge, and a lot of women now feel it's comfortable for them to go into that. And as I said, I think you have to step outside your comfort zone. And I neglected to mention as well that when I was a young person, toys are important, um, but I did get many medical kits. You know, those, those were given to me, and, and I could play doctor and, and operate on my doll, and that was the last time I got a doll when I operated on the doll. And, you know, you take all the candy little uh, pills and, and all that sort of thing, and, and it, it's okay, and that it's fine for you to play w with those sorts of things. So I think that there has to be somewhat of a, a psychological and an attitude change and that it's okay if uh, girls want to play with erector sets and if they want to go into to engineering. I took physics and um, certainly enjoyed it, but it was just one of those core sorts of courses I was taking to pursue medical research. Thank you. I've gone way over my time here. I will, uh, now we will go to a second round of questions and uh, you'll recognize Dr. Ehlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will try to be brief because I'm also supposed to be at the Education and Labor Committee meeting, but I decided this was more important. Uh, just for interest, uh, my sister Malay here, yes, after reading her testimony, got this idea, and to her colleagues on the staff, she asked them to draw pictures, and <laughs> that they were all male except one. Three women scientists were all male. Three women scientists, the rest were all male. So the problem goes on and on and on. I, um, role, role models, and there's been some discussion then, it's, it's a very tricky business. And I've been fascinated by that over the years, even in my own experience with my family. I'm a scientist, a nuclear physicist, and I did not deliberately did not try to encourage any of my children to go on to math or science. I did, however, but almost require them to take some math and science so they would know what it is, and so they'd make an intelligent decision about whether or not they wanted it. And so uh, uh, one of my sons is an engineer and just loves it. Uh, my daughters uh, make heavy use of the technical knowledge, but they are not in technical fields, but it's just very useful to them, and they've advanced because of that. The youngest son, who informed me at a very early age that he was never going to study math, he was never going to be a scientist, and just, you know, was vehement about it, and hated math in high school and so forth, and just, just had uh, rebelled all the way through, and today is a professor of geophysics. The point is simply you never know what's going to happen that's going to affect their lives. Uh, my last question or comment, uh, Dr. Hansen, you mentioned that several countries, uh, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Albania, Thailand, have made great progress in creating gender equity. Uh, how did how'd they do this? What Was this intentional? Is it, or is it cultural within their culture? Or did they come up, find some magic way to do this? <laughs> I think it's some of both. If you look at all equity issues on gender in those countries, they tend to be uh, ahead, not just uh, women in science. I, I think part of it is um, equity in the larger education system with the uh, social uh, socialized education and, and medicine. So the, the problem that we were talking about earlier with unequal access to good education doesn't happen to the same extent there. Um, the the climate of gender is different in those countries. Women are a larger number of scientists, larger number of professionals. Uh, women don't see uh, being a professional as being in conflict with uh, being a mother or family member. This is a big problem for keeping girls out of science. They don't know. They think they have to be married to science. <laughs> they can't be married to anybody else. So as you get into gender climates where uh, people don't believe that anymore, in some of these countries they pay people to stay home and, and uh, be with their kids so, so you can uh, have uh, status and access from being both in these countries. So uh, I think when we make better education and have more uh, 
equitable gender climates will also improve science, although they have been working in particular on, you know, smaller classes, more accessibility, better trained teachers. But, but I think it's the larger cultural issue that's as important. Any other comments on that? Ms. Bogue? Yeah, I think, um, and I appreciate your comments. We had, uh, my husband is also a mechanical engineer, and we, our, our daughter spent a lot of time telling us she would never go into engineering, and if she did, she'd never go into mechanical. Well, she's a mechanical engineer, so <laughs> they can't get past us sometime. But I think that um, with role models, it's very, very important to understand that there are very negative role models out there, too. Um, that if you have people in um, science and engineering and mathematics, who are demonstrating to people that there is no life outside of those fields or who are representing it in that way, um, then that really is a big discouragement factor for students. Or if you, as I mentioned earlier, if you set up your curricula so that there isn't room to go and, and uh, pursue your music or pursue other interests, that's a clear message to students that, that they shouldn't um, go on to study this because they'd have to give up too many other parts of their lives. Um, but I think that going back to the, the role modeling again, that it's extremely important, but we do have to remember that there are negative role models and address that. And to make these changes, there has to be real intentionality. It has to be something like what we see with Girls Inc. where, where they're really working with those kids. And what's remarkable about that organization is it's not just one camp or one time. They keep going back to the students and reinforcing for them what's important and what they can do, what's valuable, and, and getting those people out in front of them. Ms. Thomas? Role models are extremely important. Um, I spent a lot of time in my youth around people who were involved in the sciences, and my brother majored in physics, so I, I knew a lot of people when I was very young who uh, were involved in the sciences. But if I could take just a second to say one thing, how people react to a situation is very important as well. Um, when I first went downtown as, as part of um, the engineering program to introduce people who were going to work for the, the city of Chicago forever uh, into d different disciplines in the water department. The reason I went um, was the chief filtration engineer whom I worked for, he had daughters, and he believed that girls should not be working ships or be in a plant with men and whatever. And I was up for a promotion, and the only way to promote me was to put me out into the filtration uh, as, a, um, as a control chemist, and he didn't want to do that person I went downtown to work for, who was the chief engineer for the entire department, also only had girls, but he thought that girls should have all the advantages that boys had, and he was the one that convinced me to go back to school for engineering. So you have two people um, who have a situation, and one looks at it one way, and the other one looks at it another way. And I think that's really important, too, is how somebody reacts to a situation that they're given. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's enlightening, and I really appreciate all your testimony. On um, Speaking of jobs where you really have no life outside the job, try becoming a member of Congress. With <laughs> 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 that, I yield back. Now, it's hard to d disagree with that one. Um, no, thank, thank you, Dr. Ehlers. And uh, I, I wanted to, one thing that came to mind, I just wanted to, to mention. I. My experience when I was in, in college, you know, obviously I wasn't in SWE, but my, my friends who were in SWE seemed to really find it um, very helpful. Uh, and I think the importance of having um, support groups also, I think that's something that uh, is, is critical, whether you're, in, uh, uh, whether you're in, in college or wherever it is, uh, support groups of people who are doing uh, similar things that what you're doing is, is also something that, that can be helpful. And I think SWE certainly uh, serves that role uh, for, for a lot of women uh, who are engineering majors. Uh, well, with that, um, I want to, uh, well, before, I want, before I close, I want to thank all the witnesses for, uh, for being here today, for testifying before the, the committee. Uh, obviously, uh, this is something that is it's not going to uh, to go away. Uh, there's progress that has been made, obviously, and we've talked about that, but certainly more has to be done. And I think that this has to be considered not just a 
you know, not just an issue for, for women, but uh, for our country as we struggle uh, with uh, trying to get more people into STEM education and into the, into the STEM fields. It's critical for our, the future of our, of our country. Uh, so I thank you, all of you, for the work that, that you are doing on this. Uh, so for the uh, official statement here, the record will remain open for additional statements from members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask the witnesses. And with that, the uh, witnesses are excused, and the hearing is now adjourned. Good job.